Thank you for coming to watch Dr. Smith's video today. We encourage you to hit the subscribe button and the alert button. That way you can get notifications when he uploads a new video. Thank you for coming today. So we hope you take the time to hear and think about, and if you have a book, read in the book about the concept and the topics that we talk about. They have a lasting effect. The intent is not necessarily to treat pain, but to make permanent long-term correction with your whole family and your friends. Thank you. Make sure you subscribe and hit the alert button. Have a good day. Have a good day. Let's go ahead and get started then. It's good to see everybody here. Just so you know, there were extra seats available yesterday. So if any of you, you know, don't like sitting on the high chair, <laughs> Wednesday mornings are also an option. I am glad you're here. And I know some of you have already had a live blood analysis with me and some of you have not. So I'm going to start at the very beginning and the description of what a live blood analysis looks like. And then we'll get into the test because since this is technically Dr. Smith's class time, I'm trying to honor his testing method that he likes to teach with. Um, so a live blood analysis is best thought of as a snapshot as to what's going on in your blood at this given moment, at the, at the moment we take the blood. When I do it, you come in having not eaten for about an hour beforehand. <clears throat> I prick your finger after you clean it and I take a drop of blood, put it on a microscope slide, cover it with a cover slide, and then I put it on the microscope. I have the microscope set up so that it projects to the computer screen and we look at it at the same time, right there while the blood is still alive, okay? Technically, it starts dying the second it leaves your body, but it's viable for about 15 minutes on the slide. And once it's projected on the computer monitor, we'll look at it at two different resolutions, occasionally three, but usually two resolutions. The first is what I like to call from space. So it's the big overall picture to get a, the big picture idea of what's going on how sticky is your blood? Are there other things that are visible in your blood that maybe shouldn't be there? Because really all I should see is plasma and blood cells and some air bubbles because how the cover slide lands, it always creates some air bubbles. Um, and then from there, I'll zoom in and we'll get to, up to where we can see the, the cells individually so I can get the integrity of the cell, the health of the cells, and the true health of the plasma. Um, that's the up close and personal view, okay? And then from there, I'll always make, based on what I see for you at that time, I'll make recommendations of supplements that will specifically help those things, as well as making diet and lifestyle recommendations that will help those things. The more you can do the two together, the better your results. Do you have to do both? Nope, it's your choice. You don't have to do either. You can just get the information and, that, and, and be done with it. Um, if you choose to only use the supplements or only use the diet and lifestyle recommendations, you will still get results. They will generally be slower. Slow and steady can win the race. It depends on what you want your approach to be. I'm just there to give you the information and support you through the process. That being said, are there any questions on what I've talked about so far? No? This is a well-educated group today, so <laughs> I think that even on our test, a lot of you should know the answers. I think this is enough. You want to take one and pass them around? And do I have a volunteer reader, or am I going to read for myself? <laughs> Kathy will, will read for us. Okay, number one, red blood cells carry nutrients and oxygen to tissues, tissue and organs throughout the entire body. 
I would say true. True. And I heard that seconded over here. Back here. <laughs> That's true. So I always like to think of the blood as the life force in the body. Technically, it's one of the life forces. Two more. There you go. Everyone has one? Perfect. Um, but they do, they carry the nutrients to everything through the body, and they also help to oxygenate the tissue and organs throughout the body so that they can function like they need to. So as they travel, the cells release those, and they need to be free to do the releasing of the nutrients. If they're stuck together, they can't release, okay? And then that translates in your body to fatigue, lethargy, uh, not feeling quite right, and can also translate to malnutrition, okay? Yes. We were just talking about fingernails, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, yeah. and healthy fingernails. It seems like this would, as you get your blood in balance, that would help you would see that in your fingernails eventually. Yes, you will see it everywhere because it's throughout the body. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the fingernails though, they are slow and the change is slower, but yes. Because there is a, what does he say all the time? Continual turnover of all tissue in the body, you will see the change. I didn't know you went to make more. I still had more. Thank you. Number two. I rewrote this oh. after after I did the question, so I'm sorry about the grammar on number two. A red blood cell has a lifespan of 60 days, 120 days, 180 days, six months, or one year. Anyone remember this answer? Because I know I've told a lot of you. If you don't, that's okay. Yes, it's 120 days. <laughs> so basically, once a quarter, you have all new blood. Does it all turn over at the same time? No, that would be a bad scene. If it did. <laughs> it's continually turning over, right? Um, but technically, every quarter, if we were to look at your blood every quarter, we would see none of the same cells as what we saw before. But that's also partly why with the live blood analysis, I'll test day one, and then again at day 30 to see the changes that have taken place and do some fine tuning on what you move forward with. And then again at day 60, because by usually by day 60, there's been enough change and enough turnover that we can really modify and back off any protocol that you're doing. And again, get it more specific for what you need to just kind of proceed with in life in general. And then from there, generally, I recommend testing once a quarter just to keep a good eye on it and make sure you're still on the right path. Okay, any questions there? Next. Red blood cells are circular and round like a ball. False. They're flat. Ooh, we got a couple questioning looks. They look like a red cough drop. A red cough drop. <laughs> a lifesaver. <laughs> they are circular, but they're not spherical, so they're not round like they're a ball. Flat. They're they're flat like a coin or like a donut um, or a frisbee. They're a little thicker around the edges and a little bit thinner in the middle because they're concave on both sides in the middle, but they are round on their perimeter. Yeah. Like a gummy lifesaver. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, they don't have the gummy lifesavers don't have the hole clear through. I haven't seen one of those in and they're flexible decades. <laughs> <laughs> Much like a red blood cell is yes. flexible. Yes. So um I have a picture here right here. This is what a normal red blood cell should look like from the top, okay? This is how we should see it on the microscope slide, okay? 
Is that like a halo around it? That's just from the light reflecting from the micros microscope underneath. But no, there's not generally a, a halo. Yeah. Okay. Why does that matter that they're around? Oh, sorry. I'll let you through. It doesn't technically matter other than that's their normal shape. So when I look at your blood under the microscope, that's one of the things I'm looking at is, is it round or is it jagged like a bottle cap? Does it have variable edges or is it oval? Or does it have spikes? Has anyone in the room seen spikes in their blood? Several hands, yeah. They can be cleared out pretty darn quickly, right? Any of you who've had the retest? Yeah. Yeah. So it can be a little bit disconcerting to see spiky blood or blood cells that, they, that look like a bottle cap. They're wavy around the perimeter. But each of those things gives us information, right? Yes. Is that the shape that is most efficient for picking nutrients throughout the body? I'm going to say yes, because that's how God designed it. And he knew what he was doing. Yeah. So um, the good thing, as I was saying, is that's information that we get. If you do have spiky red blood cells, or if you do have oval red blood cells, or if they look more like a target, if the center is white instead of light, almost like it is a, an actual donut with a hole in the middle, um, it, it tells us what you're deficient in or what's going on in your body. And we then know how to support it so that you can heal and recover. Welcome. Uh, next question. Generally red blood cells move in groups in order to be more effective. False. False, false, false for many people. Correct, it's false. They should be what I call forever single. <laughs> never coupled up, never in families, never in communities. We want them to be lone wolves, solo flyers, okay? So again, they should be on their own. They should not be like this one, stacked one on top of the other. Okay, that is a fairly common to some degree finding. It's called Brulot, which is a French term for stacking of the coins. So it's literally like your, your um, red blood cells that are shaped like coins stack on each other. Sometimes they're just little short stacks. You don't have much bank, okay? Sometimes it's two or three. That's much easier to, to resolve than if it's one big long chain and you basically have a lot of bank. You don't want it banked that way. We want just single um, red blood cells. And I gave you a little precursor for that at the outset when I said they need to be able to release what they're carrying, right? So the longer, more dense the stacks, the more it looks like this, or like this, the less they can do what they need to do, and the more trouble you're in, okay? This one right here is called erythrocyte aggregation. And it really, um, generally, generally if I see that, I will recommend you go get a full blood draw, because there's usually a significant enough problem if you don't already know about that problem. Um, and we can, we can take it from there. But it, to me, it just looks like a muddy, mucky swamp. The, the cells have lost their definition and just are kind of collapsing on each other. Have I seen it resolve? Yep, I have. <coughs> it just needs the help that it needs, that you need in order for your cells to function normally, okay? That's the good news, is all of them can be resolved. And I think we're at a point where I'll go ahead and pass the pictures around. There's ants, like, it's a cheat sheet too, kind of, right? So take one, 
there may not be enough for everybody because um, it took more ink, so I didn't print as many. <laughs> so if you are coupled up, feel free to share. Uh, next question, Kathy. It is normal for the outer lining of the red blood cell to be variable with knobs and indentations. False. And I already talked about that. We don't, oh, I gave all of them. Can I have one back? <laughs> Thank you. So on your paper, there are, there's a row down here that has poculocytes, Acanthocytes, echinocytes, so these three Okay, that row shows you different examples of those things and then down here is an example of what's called mycoplasma those are the spiky ones. I think of them as landmines in the blood. We don't want landmines in there, okay? Or like the, the old-fashioned weapon, the mace. You remember the spiky ball that was on the... Yeah, we didn't use them in our lifetimes, I don't think, in the lives. They did in mine. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, so there's just some... She used some, a lot of kids. <laughs> some some hey, examples for you to, to see on there. But we already covered the rest of that. Next. Yeah. Platelets are the critical component in the blood and assist in stopping bleeding and forming blood clots. That's it. True. 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 Yeah. So platelets are another part of the blood and they float in the plasma and we must have them because they help us to stop bleeding. So if you get a cut, I got a cut on my arm the other day, so I keep like right, right under here, you would see it if I pulled up my sweater, there's a nice little scab where my platelets caused the blood to clot, okay? Um, oftentimes if you're on blood thinners, it dissolves a little bit of that stickiness so you don't clot as much because it helps with that issue that some people need. Any questions? Next, that leads right into our next question, so go ahead. If platelets are viewed in the blood, it is a good indication that there is an adequate and appropriate level of platelets. True. True. So that's actually a trick question, and I didn't mean it to be. So at the resolution we look at when I do the live blood, we cannot see them, we should not see them. They're literally, like the red blood cells, they're literally microscopic, right? We're looking at them on a microscope, but they're so much smaller than the red blood cell that even in this picture, there are platelets here in the, the background or the plasma, but we can't see them at all, right? Because they're so tiny. But if you could see them, that would, this would be true. If we zoomed in closer to get like, at a higher power, we would be able to see them, and that answer would be true. But at the, the level we're looking at, they shouldn't be visible. So if I see them when I test your blood, usually it will look like this picture. Second one down from the top, right. It's called platelet aggregation, okay? So there you can see actually hundreds, maybe thousands of platelets that are stuck together. And that's the only reason we can see them is because there are so many of them that have basically clotted together within the bloodstream and are flowing together that way, okay? Do we want <coughs> clots floating in our bloodstream? No, we don't. So if I see them, it's a bad sign, okay? Or it's a sign that there's something going on that we need to address. What magnification do you use? Depends on the magnification. So I start the from okay. space view, I use a 10 power magnification and then I zoom into a 40 power magnification. And then I have a 2500 power that I don't normally use. Every now and again, I'll bump <coughs> it up to a four power but usually I'm at 10 power and then 40 power. 
So what's the answer to that question? This question with what we're talking about for lifeblood is that it is false. We don't want them to be viewable in our blood when I'm looking at it. It was only tricky because it does depend on the magnification. I just don't go in that close. So we can make a note. Yes. Depends on magnification. Yes. <clears throat> Any other questions on that before we? No? He had his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Says, what are you talking about? Okay, next. Much as they exist in our outer physical world, it is normal and natural for crystals to exist in our inner circulatory world. True, false, or wait. True, false, wait. False. False. True. 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 Normal and natural for crystals to exist. I don't think they should. False. We should not have crystals floating around in our bloodstream. They look beautiful when I find them. And that's part of when I look at the, the 10 power magnification from space, I'm looking for crystals because they'll show like gemstones. There'll be blue or red or yellow or orange or clear and they're all indicative of a different problem okay so they can be uric acid crystals or cholesterol crystals the red yellow and orange crystals which look so pretty actually indicate that there's food putrefying in your gut so even though they're pretty we don't want that okay. that may be like leaky gut it can be yeah so there's a couple, this one here is the a picture of a uric acid crystal, but it looks like a cholesterol crystal because the cholesterol crystals show up clear like that. <clears throat> and uric acid crystals are usually blue. Um, there's a terrible picture down here of a red crystal. It just looks like a black, black blob, but you do have samples of that on your paper. In true color, it looks red or yellow or orange on the, on the slide. So again, it's information, right? If we know they're there, we can address it. And we can actually get them to dissolve. You can get them to dissolve if you do what you're supposed to do. I will guide you through the process. Next. White blood cells come in various types and can be viewed in several shapes, sizes, and forms. True. So there are five types of white blood cells. Do I see them all when I look at your blood? Sometimes. But sometimes I'll see more of one type than the other. It doesn't really matter other than for this purpose we're talking about um, that there are five kinds, they, sh they are in the bloodstream, and um, their shapes change because they're usually on the move, okay? So I was actually testing a lady's blood the other day, and she had enough going on on the one screen that we were looking at that I had noted a couple of things mentally, but I was mid-explanation of something with her. And one of the things was a white blood cell. It was a like, perfect prime example. And I was going to point it out to her and I finished my explanation and pointed back to it and it had moved over here and it was a completely different shape. And I said, oh, I was gonna show you this perfect. And she said, no, no, I saw it. And I watched it move, it's so cool. <laughs> so they, we, can, we can see them on the move in the blood doing what they do. Um, comment back here. From the back. We've talked about that very thing in the class on the lymphatic system. We talked about the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, that's the white blood cells. And they all should be present. It, when you have a medical blood test, you will have neutrophils, lymphocytes, there's a acronym. He's never, going through the acronym in his head. Never let monkeys eat bananas <laughs> those, those are all the, the different kinds of cells that are made from stem cells and they're wandering around in the bloodstream 
looking for a terrorist, and they all have a different job. So when Deborah looks at the live blood, that's what you see when you see the white blood cells. It, they don't have insignias. You can't tell if they're Army or Navy or Marines, but they're do, doing their job. So on your picture paper, you do have examples. The neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes. I'm trying to go in order. Monkeys, Monkeys eat eosinophils yeah. and basophils. Okay. There is um, basophil up here, but there's there's a row. Um, eosinophil, lymphocyte, monocyte. Okay, all along here. They all look a little bit granular. The next question has also to do with white blood cells. Kathy, can you read that? On an average viewing of a single drop of blood. There should be equal parts red blood cells and white blood cells. False. False. Yeah, pretty much everyone knows that answer. Anyone who's had a regular like blood draw at the hospital or at the, I can't remember the name of it, blood clinic, um, they always will talk about the RBC count and the WBC count, white blood count, red blood count. And if you look at the numbers, the white count is almost always significantly lower than the red blood cells because that's how we're designed, right? So they should never be in equal parts. When I'm looking at looking at it on the slide, ideally, if I see one or two, maybe three white blood cells, each time I move your slide around, so on each time I see a different screen, then I know you've got a pretty good level of white blood cells, as long as the plasma is clear, right? If I see a lot of bacteria or fungus happening in your blood, or if there's a lot of platelet aggregation in your blood, I expect there to be more white blood cells in there dealing with that issue, right? If you get sick, your blood count usually goes up and sometimes I'll see a slightly higher count um, because someone's just wrapping up a cold or wrapping up the flu or you know something, a sinus infection, and they're still clearing it out, but the count is still a little bit high. So there should be significantly more red blood cells than white blood cells. Last week, I um, tested a lady's blood. She was in there with her sister who had had her own blood tested and had had a retest. So she had seen the blood on the slide a couple of times. And I put the slide up and it showed on the screen and she said, oh, because even she could tell what we were looking at and that far back view was not right. And that sample actually was inverted. It had almost all white blood cells and very few red blood cells. It looked very opposite of what it should look like. And I made a recommendation that she go get some further testing and you know look into things more, um, which she did. But I also was able to give her some good steps to get started with and proceed with. And she is feeling better already. So. It's a long way to say, yeah, there should be fewer <laughs> white blood cells than red. Okay. Any questions before we move on? I so just... if there are more white cells, then something's going on. I mean, you're sick or Some, infection if, or something. Something's going on. Because the white on. blood cells is actually doing their job. Yes. If there are more, the body has decreed that it needs more they're there for a reason yeah. so sometimes you already know that reason and sometimes you didn't know and now we can tend to it um i was just thinking about these people that sell plasma is that an okay thing to do for your body <laughs> I know people sell plasma, oftentimes college students, to make extra money. Um, it 
your blood seeks homeostasis. So it's not like it made a bunch of extra plasma and has extra to give any more than you have extra blood to give if you donate blood, right? From time to time, you can make a demand on your body like that and then support it in recovery of that. But oftentimes when people are selling plasma, they're doing it multiple times a week rather than once every couple months. It will always take a toll because your body has the levels that it needs. That being said, if you do donate blood or if you do donate plasma, support your body so it can regenerate what it needs. I actually gave blood back in December and um, immediately went home and drank salt water with real salt in the water because the plasma is made up a lot of a saline solution like that. So it, just rehydrating my body helped. And then I kept doing that for a few days and I increased the amount of um, specific supplementation I was doing to help my body replace what I had just voluntarily given up from it. Okay. I took extra magma stem for sure. <laughs> Any other questions on that? Yes. Just uh, so she was born premature, and when she was born, they said she was missing forty percent of her white blood cells. What, what would what would that indicate? Why why would she be missing white blood cells at birth? Well, so if you're premature, just not everything has finished developing. I remember actually. Do you mind me talking about this? When you, you came in to have your blood tested the first time, you told me that. And I believe they told you at that time it would be that way for your life. Right? Or no? I don't remember them telling yeah. me anything. They just gave her blood and, and you know what? And, and it, yeah. Gave so her blood. just like her lungs weren't fully developed, her eyes weren't fully developed, like every, things weren't fully cooked. Okay. Yeah. So your body will catch up. Okay. And what did we say at the beginning? There's a continual turnover. There's continual regeneration and production happening. So there's no reason at this point that that should be an issue. Gotcha. Yeah. That's a really good question, though. So my, my granddaughter was born at one pound, 14 ounces. Oh, a tiny little thing. Uh, she, she survived, and she's now four. Um, how long does it take the body to get, say, up to normal uh, when you're... When you start out that small. I'm going to defer this question to the guru. The big teacher. <laughs> well, the answer would be, it depends on how the infant is nurtured. Sometimes it can be very quickly, within a year or two. If the child, let's suppose, is nurtured good, but has compromised digestive function, then it doesn't get in. Absorb it doesn't absorb, it, so it doesn't manifest. So the, there's no set time for the answer to that question. Everybody's different, yeah. and and not all babies who are born premature survive, and many of them take years and years to catch up. And some of them never do catch up. When Denise was born, she was. A little bit weak because during Audrey's pregnancy, it was a very stressful, emotional time in our life. So the develop, development of the baby was hindered. But right now she's way past normal. She's accelerated. <laughs> You're abnormal. <laughs> I'm abnormally good. <laughs> also say that you know Denise is child number five and there were six born within a seven year span so our television was broken yeah, the television was broken they didn't have any money to go out there was nothing to do but, but my mom had like her body had 
like she was sharing a lot of what she had with the babies that she, thank goodness I'm number two, right? I got more of it at the outset. But um, she, she, I believe, was also somewhat depleted yeah, energetically, yeah. emotionally, but also nutritionally. So that could have also contributed to that. But is the baby stuck with that forever? No. It depends on nurture and environment and support and all of that. Good question. Uh, number 11. The first responders in the blood are the white blood cells, acting as trash collectors on a daily basis, and as the army called to duty in acute slash crisis situations. True. True. Yeah, we already talked about that, and that's because he likes to keep giving his army, Navy, Navy, Navy yeah. Air Force, Marines, <laughs> Coast Guard, example early you can't wait but they are the first responders in crisis situations all right but are they always at that level you asked already no they shouldn't always be at a high level but on a daily basis they're in there collecting the trash keeping it clean doing that doing their thing whether it's dying off red blood cells or other things that are in there we can actually watch them on the microscope sometimes move surround and start dissolving whatever they have found in the blood mm -hmm. and if by chance i do see a cluster of bacteria or a cluster of fungal forms how amazing is it to see maybe three white blood cells right there in that area it tells me your body is doing the right thing can we support it so it's easier on the body yep yeah. Yeah, we want to just ease the way, support the body. Any questions on that? Yes. So if you have a systemic white blood cell response, then apparently you get a large number of created all at once. If if the need is there, yes. Interesting. And those are all stem cell. Well, all of the all of the cells. Stem from stem cells. The stem cell term is, is not predetermined what type of cell it will be. So the body will say, I need white ones, so more of the stem cells will turn to the red blood cells or white blood cells. Basically, overnight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The body is smart. Cell. It knows exactly, exactly what it needs to do. I like yes. to compare the stem cells to a missionary printing his paper. The or go, who want me to go, and then they are called to different jobs. Yeah. Did you hear that? What's a T cell? So there are, it's, in my mind, it's a precursor for the white blood cell. Okay. That's part of your immune system. Immune right? system. <clears throat> Next question. It is possible to rapidly improve blood composition and flow by implementing the use of whole blood vibration, whole body blood vibration in conjunction with digestive enzymes and probiotics. True. 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 So that's true to the extent that I literally almost brought out all of my gear enlisted one of you so that I could test your blood and show it and hopefully it would look really bad <laughs> and then I would give you a digestive enzyme and a probiotic and have you go stand on the t-zone in the office for one or two minutes come back I would stick your finger again and you would look at it again and most of the time even if it starts out looking like this the rouleau, the bad, bad rouleau, it will look almost like this, if not like this, the normal blood. Mm -hmm. Is it going to stay that way? No, because we haven't resolved everything in the system. But if we can get it properly flowing and releasing what it needs to, even if it's for <coughs> five minute increments, do you think you'll feel better? Do you think your body will function better? Do you think you'll get to normal blood sooner? Absolutely. You said probiotics in what? I, uh, it says right here, probi uh, it's number 12, well, digestive enzymes and probiotic. probiotic. Yeah. 
So you've so, seen that in action previously, correct? That's why you know yeah, that. Yeah, so I've, I've done this actually, I've tested different times throughout the years and with different things. <clears throat> so my the T-zone is like this one, right? The, the big one that some of you have. Um, I've also tested it with using a rebounder, the mini trampoline, okay? Because that also kind of force moves gently your lymphatic system and your circulatory system, okay? I've also tested it with the Chi machine, which <laughs> some of you know what it is, some of you don't, but basically it's a machine. You lay on the floor, put your ankles on it, and it moves you like this, like a fish. So it's a gentle, gentle movement of the lymphatic and circulatory systems. All three of those will change the blood. The for, the zone, good. for the good. Yes, it will move it more towards normal. <laughs> All three of them will. The T zone has has moved moved it the most. So in that order, I told you that the T zone or whole body vibration and then the rebounder and then the chi machine in that in, in that order there is most effective, the least effective. If you have a chi zone, is it necessary to use a chi machine? Is it necessary? No. I help? have both and I use both. You use both? Yeah. Depending on what I want to do because I'll lay on the floor and use a chi machine just to get that motion. It helps it helps in a different way and in a different plane. Mm -hmm. It's horizontal rather than vertical. Mm -hmm. So I use both. Dr. Smith uses both. Could I make a comment? Absolutely. I have a lady who about a month and a half ago came in with pulse ox of about 89, 88. And her husband said, it's always about that never above 90. She came in again last Friday, I check it again, it's still about 89. It was 89. So I'd like to experiment both times, a month ago and last Friday. I put her on this T-zone for two minutes. I put the tester on to recheck her pulse ox. It was 94. Wow. Both times. Now, hmm. what's the lesson that if she has a tears on her home? If she uses it one time for 12 minutes, it does her good. But if you were to use it 10 times for one or two minutes, she would get more value. Because and that was without any supplementation. That was those, just the T-zone. Oh, only the T-zone. Yeah. And, and you talked about the the trump the rebounder and the chi machine that helps stimulate the bones so right then the bones are producing more stem cells right the then and they, they move the very very, very fast and at a low level do it or yeah so usually level one to ten just keep it low and i am weird I invite you, if you want to be weird like me, you can do what I do. Um, there are different benefits derived from the different numbers, right? The different frequencies you hit on the T-zone. So I tie the number of the T-zone, the speed, to the date. So today is the 14th. Everything I do today on the T-zone will end in a four. Tomorrow when it's the 15th, it will be five. So I'll start at level five. And if I'm doing any strength training, I'll put it to level 15. And if I use it at night to relax before I go to bed, I'll put it to 45. And then the next day on Saturday, when it's the 16th, it'll all be sixes. That just make you don't have to. It's just a thing I do to make sure I use all the numbers and get all the benefits. So do you have to have the same number of coins in both pockets of your pen? I don't have pockets. <laughs> it makes a lot of noise. You are really weird. <laughs> I know it's weird. It's, it's funny. Funny. It makes your hips bigger. Yeah. Okay, I, don't, I don't think it's weird. I think it's smart because every every time you change the speed, one, like one to two, two to three, 13 to 14, it, it changes the, the frequency, the, the energy 
in your body. So she's getting a full spectrum of energy during the therapy rather than just one or two. So we can do like, I just have the platform. Mm -hmm. um, Same thing. I, I use the third program and it goes from, I think, goes 5, 10, 15, 20, and then back down. I would be able to do that on the fifth and the tenth, and then. <laughs> <laughs> I know. If yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's benefits to all of them, and it's nice to have the preset protein yeah, program because you do get variable right. speeds, right? Mm -hmm. You're not just on one speed, but if you only use one speed, is it going to help? Yeah. Yes. You can just leave it on one forever. That's fine. I just have all the numbers, and I like to smell all the flowers, and you know. <laughs> Get the variety. Variety is the spice for me. Any other questions on that? Okay, next. The best method to make long-term improvement to blood composition is to use direct targeted supplementation and nutrition. I would say true. I mean, that's a little bit of a loaded question, right? Because yeah. that's what we're talking about. Doing the live blood analysis allows us to get really direct and targeted. And like I said earlier, the more you can implement the supplementation as well as the diet and lifestyle suggestions, the better you'll be and the longer term it will be. That being said, enough of you have been in for testing. You've got my little paper where I give you all of the information on the back. There's a whole list of dietary recommendations. And I circle things that are specific to you right now that's in your blood. That being said, everything that's on that list is good for all of us all the time. So the more of those you can implement on a daily, regular basis, the better long-term results you'll have. It just takes responsibility on your part and thinking on your part to do those things. And I recommend, just as an aside on that, if you were to implement more Start with one. Don't try to do everything all at once or you'll get overwhelmed and give up. Start with one and get it part of your routine. Then add another and get it to be part of your routine. But you can sure get a lot of those others in your study. <laughs> yes. Yep, you can. It can be simple to do, but at the outset it takes some thought and effort. Yep. So now we're on number 14. Yes. Water is the main component of the blood. Therefore, proper hydration is necessary for healthy blood. True. True. So whenever I think of the plasma, which again, it's what looks like the background on the slide, right? That's the plasma or the river that the cells are flowing in. The higher and more normal our water level in our river, the better everything can flow. Um, this morning I tested a lady and as soon as I was trying to get the drop of blood from her finger, I had an inkling of what I was going to see on the slide. I said, you are dehydrated. I put it on the slide and put the cover slide on it and it did not move very much, which confirmed to me she's dehydrated. We put it up on the microscope. Sure enough, she's dehydrated. So all of the cells are crowded closer together and it makes it harder for them to move and flow and do what they're trying to do. They're right? sticky? They're, well, it, they're not necessarily sticky, but they're, it's like cramming cattle into a cattle car. They're, they're more crowded than if they were in the because field. Because of the lack of the water. Yes, because of the lack of the water. The more hydrated you are, the, the smoother the river will flow and the more easily everything can, can, can work in the bloodstream. So one of the recommend, I'm sorry, did someone, no, that was Chelsea. <laughs> I heard you. Um, one of the recommendations I give to a lot of people is, first of all, I guess it's a two-step recommendation, first of all, to drink enough water in a day. How much do you need? Half That's your body amazing. weight in ounces as a minimum. Okay, so if you weigh 200 pounds, you need at least 100 ounces. 
If you weigh 150 pounds, you like how I'm doing the easy math? Mm -hmm. If you weigh 150 pounds, <laughs> you need at least 75 ounces as a minimum for the day. Okay? I would drown. Pardon? I would you drown. Would drown. So That's what it feels like. part, part B to this recommendation is to use salt in your water therapeutically. What I mean by that is that you deliberately add, preferably in the morning, real salt, Redmond real salt to your water. I generally will recommend you start with eight ounces of water and put a quarter of a teaspoon of real salt in it. Stir it up and take a drink. When you drink it, it should taste good to you. It, at that combination, it might taste weak. It might taste super salty. I don't know for you because every body is different and every body, every body has different needs. <coughs> but that's a good place to start. So put a quarter <coughs> teaspoon and adjust to your taste. For me, I use a half of a teaspoon in eight ounces of water and I use it every morning and it tastes so good to me. But that's because my body has trouble holding on to minerals. So I just constantly keep that flow coming in. Does my blood pressure ever get too high? Never. It has a normalizing homeostatic effect on the body. So it's one of the simplest, most cost effective things everybody can do to improve their blood is to get enough water and to use the salt to help your body better use the water that you do get so you don't drown. Can you do it more than once a day? Yep, sometimes I do it twice in a day. And usually it's because I feel like I need more. Yes. Um, my daughter lives part-time in Mackey and their water is alkaline. Mm -hmm. So I've been bringing that water home and drinking it and for me, that water, after it took me a minute tastes better and I want more I'm, and I'm not sure why that is but it it's like my thirst is more more stimulating for yeah. that water that's good so your body is craving something that's good for you and Mackie does have good water good alkaline water our water around here because of the high mineral co content in the soil tends to be quite alkaline we're not talking about that with adding the salt, but the, alkal the more alkaline that you can get your body, also usually the, the healthier you're going to be, and alkaline water can help with that. Okay, so should we not be filtering our water? We have a lot of water. Oh, Deb, tell, tell your story. Tell your story. Of your bottle, your bottle, your water you bought at the store and your tap water. Oh, uh, so yeah, so <laughs> it, it depends. If I had a good well, at my house, I would drink it straight out of the faucet. I wouldn't filter it. Because a lot of the reason you're filtering it is to get the chlorine and the fluoride and the pharmaceuticals that, get, that you don't have. It's already clean, right? Um, there may be, I don't know, you might want it softened. You might want to use a water softener because your minerals might be really hard. But if it were me, I wouldn't filter it. I would just drink it. Um, I actually am a little bit of a water snob and my husband has been fully converted and I like we don't have great water at our house and so we go to the store fill up five gallon jugs because I'm too inefficient to have it delivered to my house <laughs> I fill up the five gallon jugs with multi filtered water right so you seen the water, the glacier water machines, the different water machines. Some, some of them have five stages of filtration, some of them have seven stages of filtration, and we use that water almost, almost exclusively for cooking and drinking. And I have another, like a stainless steel water bottle from a company, it's called Dylan, D-Y-L-N. I ordered it from Dylan.com, and it has a little insert that goes into it that's mostly made out of magnesium that turns your water alkaline. So I make sure that I drink alkaline water at the beginning of every day, okay, or at the end of every day, just to help alkalize my body. 
and I was not sure if I needed to replace that filter because every so often you need to put a new one in. So I got out my testing materials and I tested what should have been or used to be alkaline water in that vessel. And it tested at, I think it was 5.5, oh. which is very acidic, right? And then I was like, oh, clearly I need a new filter, but is it working at all? So I went to my jug that before I put it into the water alkalizer to test it, the good water I paid money for at the store. And it tested at 4.9. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I tested the water out of my faucet and it tested at 7.4. <laughs> and I thought, have I been deliberately acidifying my body trying to drink clean water, clean filtered water, and instead of drinking more alkaline water that's maybe not as filtered and clean, like how do I fix this, right? So even if you buy water, it may not be better. Your <coughs> water is significantly better than that. Your Mackey water is significantly better than that. Where do you get the test kit? Online. Like on, on the Amazon.com. Amazon.com. Water test. Yeah, uh, oh. pH, water pH test. Does it have to be water? Can we use those? So you you can use some the strips, but get. the strips that I have specifically say they're not for testing water. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. says on there, use test like pH drops to test the water. Um, and I did notice a, a difference when I did them yeah. different ways. Yeah. More yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Test strips that we get for the urine. Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing with the water. Yeah. I I don't. I just had a bunch of other strips, so I don't have those ones. I didn't try those. Those will work for testing the water. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I worked in the agronomy field for yes. years. And we used to test wells all the time. So we knew what was coming through the water, but so we could make determinations about what to put on the field. And with the exception of Ashton and EG Bench, all of them are pretty much. They're pretty clean, right? And pretty alkaline. They're pretty clean and they're all, almost all alkaline. Yeah, oh, in this good. area, we're very, so, very alkaline water. And we, we live in a wonderful valley. <laughs> We have a filtration system naturally built into this valley. All that Through the rock, the lava, and, yeah, all of that. So very, very I immediately started drinking my tap water <laughs> <laughs> instead of the other. And I ordered a new thing for my water alkalizer at just a couple of the bases. There was what about soda? When do you like drinking like when making soda baking soda. Baking soda. Baking soda. Oh, yeah. soda in your lives. So if you need to <laughs> add an, an alkalizing agent to your water to make it more alkaline, baking soda is a fantastic, inexpensive alkalizing Be agent. Besides the salt? So the salt doesn't necessarily alkalize it. It just, it talks to your body's DNA and helps you better use it. It doesn't turn it alkaline. The so Because the of the mineral salts in yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you minerals. Yeah. Come if, yes. it, if it buy alkaline water at the grocery store, like 8.3, we'll, we'll say that purified water with salt Salt's added. added. They added either real salt or they added uh, some Table other salt. salt they got. Table with, salt? Yeah, usually no, we'll no, say a couple salt. of minerals that are added or a couple of salts that are added to make it alkaline. Yeah, Comfort, the comfort salt. Okay, so let's do our last question because I think we're out of time. If you're not testing, you're guessing. True. That one's true. And it's easy to test. It's simple to test. And then you don't have to guess. Yes. I have a question. Yes. To find this class online, how, where do we go and how do we get it? How do you get it? That's a good question. It's the bottom of your paper. So, okay. Of your test. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. I did, I did handily put this on the handout for you. The YouTube channel for Dr. Smith is 
Dr. Dwayne H. Smith, D-U-A-N-E H. Smith. All of the classes that are taught in this room are put on YouTube. So this one, it's being recorded today. It will be up there probably in a week. And the handouts will be attached. So if you have a friend or someone who wasn't able to come, you can send them there. But also, all of the classes from the last close to a year are on there. And the ones up yeah. in the green room are old and they're from his office. The yes. ones in the green room without his glasses on, usually, because <laughs> <laughs> the light reflected, are, are older, but it's still viable information. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Dr. Dwayne H. Smith on YouTube has all of them. Yeah. Make sure you like, like the videos, subscribe to the videos, share the videos so you can just share what he's... Help, help more people. Okay. It's free, right? I mean, it's free yeah. information how to be healthier. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all thank for you. coming. Any thank other questions before we... <laughs> Done. Last chance. All right. Thank you.